Hello everyone, welcome to Field Notes, an exploration of functional medicine. I'm Rob Downey, a family practice MD and Institute for Functional Medicine certified practitioner. I'm coming to you from Seaworthy Functional Medicine in Homer, Alaska. Seaworthy exists to help people overcome their health challenges and be fully vital. Today we are fortunate enough to have with us Tom Blue, an entrepreneur with many years of expertise in delivering healthcare, which is root cause based uh, medicine and healthcare practices. And uh, thanks for being with us today, Tom. Oh, it's a pleasure. Thanks for having me. <laughs> so I, I, I think I want your help today in your bio because uh, you've done and you do a lot, whether it's the living matrix or lead health, which is a way that businesses can keep employees healthy. Uh, you've got a, a since the advent of the pandemic, you've created a place for people to learn how to use their functional medicine or related types of medicine to help people be resilient in the face of COVID. So what should our listeners know today about sort of your background and where, you know, where you fit in the functional medicine um, universe? Yeah, well, you know, it's um, the, I guess I became very interested in this, in this field in a little bit of an unusual way. It, it started all the way almost 20 years ago now. I got involved with, with setting up what was the first uh, membership-based medical practice in Virginia and, uh, and, and had had no medical practice experience. It was, uh, you know, I was, it was an entrepreneurial endeavor that an investor had, uh, had, had invited me into. And, and when we set the practice up, you know, it was a little bit unusual because we were starting from dead scratch and we had to go and recruit a physician. And, and so I was looking for an office space and, and, and ended up setting the office up right next door to Richmond, Virginia's first uh, electron beam tomography scanner. And, uh, and so it was the very, very earliest days of coronary calcium scanning. It did three things. It did coronary calcium scanning, whole body scanning, and a virtual colonoscopy. Mm. The two things in that list that got me excited turned out to be pretty much useless. But the one thing that I didn't know what it was, you know, was the most important of the group. <laughs> so it turns out the virtual colonoscopy was a disaster. You had to be inflated in order to have the colonoscopy done. And the, and the body scan was just filled with noise and it caused more stress than good. But the coronary calcium scanning was good. And right about that time, you know, the uh, down in North Carolina, it, the Liposcience had just come out with the very first advanced lipid lab panels. And so what I watched was our doctor who had very few patients, we recruited him and, and only a few kind of followed on. So we had to grow the practice. He had time. And, and we had a practice model that invited patients were, were paying a, mem a small membership fee, but, but it, it allowed us to do some things that were not yet covered by insurance. And what I discovered was that there was this, this whole other world of, possi of possibility in medicine that was well proven, safe. It just hadn't made it into the, you know, into the hands of the general public because it wasn't yet recognized by insurance. Doctors didn't have time to learn about it yet. But we had this magnificent cardiovascular risk program, and so that just sort of set in motion for me this this very this very, I guess, deep fascination with. And I don't think that this 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 exists anywhere else in our whole economy where. Where, where in fact, sitting here today, there exists a version of medicine that is 15 years in the future or 20 years in the future. And, and, and all people have to do is essentially decide they're gonna find it and, and the hard part, find a doctor who is, who is thinking that way, who's investigating and bringing forward the future of medicine today in their practice. And so anyway, I, I have found a, a very happy home amongst doctors doing that with uh, the Institute for Functional Medicine and the functional medicine kind of community of which you're a part. And, mm -hmm. um, and so it's, um, you know, it's just whether, whether it is bringing it to consumers in sort of a retail setting or to companies or payers through, you know, through, through other ways of packaging it so that they can access it for employees. It's just, uh, it's always been very exciting to me. Oh, cool. Well, I want to thank our listeners for joining us, and I want to give them a little sense of how your and my paths cross. So I think it was three years ago, could have been four, but it was the F Institute for Functional Medicine Annual International Conference in Florida, and that year's topic was autoimmunity. And so uh, you... Uh, 
you wrapped up the conference saying, hey, everybody, all of, all of you in the audience who had this intuition that functional medicine has this greater, grander manifestation benefiting society, benefiting the people you've wanted it to help. Here's what's happening at this company called Lead Health, where the, the company keeps the employees healthy that participate in this and sort of everybody wins. And all of us practicing functional medicine felt like I knew things like that were, were coming in the kind of work that I do. And it, it seems like there's hundreds or thousands of, of manifestations of this yet to come, whether it's countries, businesses, et cetera, because there's so much win-win to be had in functional medicine. And it was such a good time for me to hear your hope and inspiration because then between hearing that and today, I stripped my practice down to the chassis and an Institute for Functional Medicine affiliated business coach, Dan Kalish, helped me rebuild it from the ground up in what I see as a very contemporary way. And then today we get to talk about sort of um, like why functional medicine is a good idea for folks, but also why the business of functional medicine is really important to the viability of it, of it being available to people. Mm -hmm. um, so, um, you know, what, what's your take now then on like, um, like now that you've been with IFM for a while, like why would a person be interested in functional medicine at this juncture, knowing what you know now? Well, for, as a, as a, as a consumer or a patient, the, um, you know, the, the, the choice that is in front of us and it's, and it's one that, has, that is really striking employers as well. Uh, is that is that we now kind of have discovered that that there are particularly people faced with many chronic conditions, maybe not all, but many. There's a choice to either manage that condition in the world of disease management, or the un, the, the rarely spoken of choice to actually reverse the condition or dramatically de-escalate it. And and you know whether you're on the payer side of things as an employer or a health plan covering the cost of healthcare, or you are the person you know, whose, you know, whose health is, is at stake, the idea of, of reversing a condition is a heck of a lot better than managing it perpetually for life. I mean, when you look at the definitions of disease management, you know, it's essentially the goal of it, as you well know, is to, is to simply slow the progression of it to as close to a flat line as you can. And, and when you then sort of see how that's accomplished, it's basically with ever more, more potent means of suppressing the symptoms of that condition. And then of course, an aim is to teach the person to sort of re-identify with the disease and that they're gonna have this forever and to learn to adjust their life to the disease. And so it's a very hopeless kind of concept right from the get-go. And, and what we're finding now is, is that people are kind of waking up, a lot of people starting in, in the, in, in with, with insulin resistance and diabetes, type two diabetes, saying, look, you know, they're discovering that, hey, you know what, I actually don't have to live with this for the, you know, for the rest of my life. If, I'm willing to participate. You know, that is the one big caveat is that unlocking the potential of this, it requires a doctor that has, you know, that has done the work to understand how to, you know, how to set the stage, but it definitely requires a patient that's willing to participate. And that's, and that's not everybody, mm -hmm. uh, but, but it's more people than you might think, you know, if you can wake them up, up to the possibility of it. Mm -hmm. And so, so as a patient, you know, I think, well, I mean, you know, I don't, the, 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 did, did you hear my talk on, on health as a skill? I don't know. I don't believe so. Okay. So, so this is, this is a, was a, just a, something that, that kind of dawned on me. Um, you know, I'd been spending a lot of time in the, you know, in the genetics world and, and I, I kind of was reflecting on, um, you know, how the, the story of health has over the last, I don't know, certainly, 19 years, but probably more like 15 years, has really flipped for the first time in human history. And, and, and by that, what I mean is if you think all the way back to the dawn of time, people thinking about health, the, you know, the, 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 where does health come from? Where does disease come from? Could be the will of the gods, bad luck, the past sins of my ancestors. You know, it, it, all you know is, is that it comes from out there and it just happens to you. And, and that's kind of that. So fast forward, you know, to 30 years ago, well, you know, 
it, it, it's, it comes from out there and, and it was, and it kind of remained a bit of a mystery. Well, then 2001 rolls around, we sequence a human genome and, and the world is alerted that we've cracked the code of life and, 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 you know, we can, you know, we can, you know, we can sort of read this book of life and, and this is where our health comes from. So it's a higher tech story. I think it's actually kind of a stupider story than the, than the previous ones, but in any case, it's a higher tech story, but it's still one of predestination instead of the will of the gods or, or fate or whatever. Now it is the will of my genome. And, and so what we've learned since that time, of course, is that that was a grave misunderstanding. Now, anybody who's ever been around identical twins for long enough to watch them start out as clones and become very differentiated as they get older knows that, you know, somehow people with identical genetics become different. And, <laughs> and what we know today is that, in fact, only about 20% or so of, of, of what we experience as health and disease kind of arises from our genetics. The other 80%, give or take a little, is, is born out of essentially decisions we make. How do we sleep? How do we eat, rest, deal with stress, interact with the world around us? And so, and this is kind of, you can't really argue, you might argue it's 75 instead of 80 or 82 instead of 80, but it's the great majority of our health comes from you know, these decisions. Well, if, if the majority of our health comes from decisions that we make, then therefore health is primarily a skill. And so the problem is, is that health is a skill for which we have absolutely no training institutions. And so, and so when I think now about a functional medicine doctor and a person wanting to explore the possibility of health. So, so think about it. the story of health went from fate to, you know, from, from predetermined to self-determined, you know what I mean? From mm -hmm. fate to skill. And, and so, which is an, a, a wonderfully exciting and empowering sort of thing to, you know, thing to realize. But then you also realize that it requires to, to, to cultivate and develop the skill. You've got to have a, a partner. You have to have some kind of a sensei, you know what mm -hmm. I mean? To sort of, mm -hmm. sort of guide you through this. And, and to me, that's what the functional medicine physician sort of workforce is, is, you know, there's a teaching and mentorship component to functional medicine that for people looking to, to sort of explore the possibilities of their health and not just experience health and, and sickness always sort of within the horizon of death, you know, but rather mm -hmm. within the horizon of possibility, the only type of medical relationship you can, you, you'll be happy in is, is, a, is one focused on root causes and functional medicine, in my opinion. Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, you're lighting me up all over again. And I'm sure that these are things that that had me uh, feeling the sense of excitement and joy as I left the annual international conference in that I think that the way you described it felt very succinct to me. And it fit with a couple of other aha moments I was having at the same time. So The Disease Delusion by Jeff Bland, the book, was talking about this idea that conventional medicine is optimal for about 20 to 25 percent of what we deal with. What's the right surgery for this brain tumor? What's the right antibiotic for this pneumonia? What's the right way to set this broken bone? And there was this irony then of conventional medicine kind of trying to turn a screw with a wrench um, in this three quarters of what people bring to the table has this complex chronic backstory. And as we understand that backstory, we empower people to uh, sort of retroactively solve these riddles and then carry that forward into solutions. And as you alluded to, so many people are delighted about the reversal of things that they had been fatalistic about. And they were well-intentionedly told, well, you're sort of fated with this. And they say, well, I'm, I, my conventional doctor told me I'm not needing my blood sugar medication anymore. I just happen to be getting lean with whole food. I'm sleeping better. I've got more energy. My joints don't hurt as much. This restoration of vitality is a very reiterative theme in functional medicine, which is sort of a delight to everybody. Mm -hmm. It sure is. You know, it's interesting you bring up Jeff's book. One of the things that, um, you know, that I kind of took from, from that and just from knowing him is, is this realization that, you know, he, he, the book's titled A Disease Delusion, you know, and, and, and in many ways, I kind of also think of it as, as a, the diagnosis delusion as well. 
yeah, I got involved with a project the uh, you know a few years ago where we were developing essentially a, a, a care path episode of care for for migraine. And you know, of course, there are you know, millions of people around the country, world, of, you know, suffer for many, many, many years, oftentimes with you know with migraine, thinking that that they and everyone else labeled with the diagnosis of migraine has the same thing. And so, what we decide, what we did is we began to you know because when you're developing it as, as a program, you've got to be much more sort of strict around you know how how the pieces work. But we wanted to be able to understand the root cause profiles of migraine. And, and this is, it was the classic example of, of how there is, you know, sort of many causes, one effect and many, you know, and, and vice versa. And mm -hmm. so, and so as we were digging into this, you know, and teasing apart these root cause subtypes, we discovered, okay, there are people that have migraine primarily as a result of a hormone imbalance. There are people with migraine primarily as a result of glucose toxicity, toxic mm -hmm. toxicity jaw and facial issues, neck and back injury. And so think about this for a second. And this for people listening to this, it's like, think how different those root causes are. If you're a person, you know, if you're a person suffering from migraine as a result of an issue with your jaw, and you have a friend who's got migraine as a result of issues with glucose, there's absolutely no way that you're going to address, do anything but suppress the symptoms of migraines when they happen with medications until you understand your underlying cause. Though obviously the way you would correct those two things are so profoundly different. And so one of the things that I really, I, I think people find most exciting about engaging in a functional medicine relationship is the opportunity to sort of look past a diagnosis that many people take on almost as an identity to look past that as even a thing and find what really is the underlying cause sort of profile for their, you know, for the problem that they're having. And, and, and once you've made the discovery, now you are at the starting line for reversing it. You know, mm -hmm. and still, if you're, if you're still identifying just with a diagnosis as though it's a thing, think about it. what, what, what is migraine other than the name that some people gave to blinding headaches that make your vision screwy, you know, you know what I'm saying? It was just mm -hmm. it's arbitrary. It is not anything. It's a delusion. So, right. You know, it's, it's such a cool thing. The ability to look beyond that for people that, you know, that have been wrestling with a chronic condition for so many years, wondering why did my friend stop drinking red wine and it helped and it didn't help me, you know, as though mm -hmm. they're fighting the same, you know, the same enemy. You know what I mean? It's, it's really right. something. Right, right. To add to what you're saying for the benefit of our listeners. So uh, I think given that you and I b both were uh, unsurprisingly inspired by Dr. Bland's work and ideas, um, you know, this idea of the disease delusion is a disease like tuberculosis makes sense as a disease because it's an organism that manifests. It's kind of a one-to-one -one association. The organism gets in there, it wreaks havoc in a certain way. But so many of the things we call diseases have been, again, these convenient labels for phenomena, which have multiple different roots, thus over-identifying with the name right. uh, diminishes one's relationship with illuminating the root causes and then the downstream manifestations uh, abate and the, you know, the disease uh, starts to take on a sort of a transparency, uh, <laughs> a, a go away uh, right. quality that um, it's refreshing for everyone, whether it's the sure. employer, the employee, the patient, the doctor. Um, so one reason I was so excited to talk to you today is I thought it'd be a nice chance for people to hear what are you seeing out there in the world in 2020? I worry that the pandemic is maybe making people closer and tighter in some ways, but I also worry that it's creating worsening fragmentation and siloing and that it's maybe blocking us off from some good news. Mm -hmm. And so I got to hear your good news three to four years ago that businesses wanted functional medicine. Uh -huh. And um, I know there's some interesting things that have happened in China with like large block. Uh, again, when I was there in 2017, there was a group of, uh, 
representatives of, uh, I, I, again, I think a big company that was doing yeah. some functional medicine work. So what's the news out there in 2020 of what's happening in functional medicine as like macro scale trends of adoption, you know, just that people would find interesting or that they might need to know if they're interested. Yeah, well, you know, the 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 neat thing is, you know, at a at a really macro level that, you know, the 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 interest from the consumer all the way to the payer and the health system in, in, in functional medicine does nothing but grow every every month. And and the drivers of that uh, you know are well, there are a number of them. So so number one, I think just when you think about us as people. Uh, and as a society, there where we are, we're observing a kind of a shift in values as it relates to our relationship to healthcare, healthcare providers, our own health, uh, in the direction of empowerment. And it's I don't think that it has to do very much with people kind of waking up to health as a skill, as much as just this, you know, the, this kind of I think people are at the end of the rope with. Every time I go to the doctor, I get a new diagnosis and I get a new pill that I now have to take for the rest of my life. You know, and, and just intuitively, I think people are kind of realizing how it just doesn't quite add up that the only way to solve a problem that I have with my body is to become dependent on a substance my body never made in the first place. You know, as, as mm -hmm. Mark Hyman says, you know, is my depression really a Prozac deficiency? Mm -hmm. you, know, it, you know, that kind of thing. And so that's just kind of one of these common sense things. So I think people's minds are open to this idea that, that they're going to gravitate to, you know, to people that, you know, to practitioners more and more that have a, you know, that have, that, that are, are able to sort of uh, direct their willingness to change in the mm -hmm. most efficient high yield way. And so mm -hmm. this notion of personalized lifestyle medicine, you know, in many ways, the application of functional medicine uh, from the, from the consumer standpoint uh, is, ju is just, it just more and more resonates with our values. There's also another sort of thread of our values that I think really aligns with this concept, which is more and more our focus on sustainability, you know, in the environment and the world around us. It's like, it is not sustainable to go through life accumulating more and more ongoing costs. We know that healthcare costs too much already. It's already sort of essentially depleted people of their retirement. It's like every dollar more we have to spend on healthcare is a dollar less people can make as a salary. You know what mm -hmm. I mean? Employers are paying the money out and it's going to healthcare and not into 401ks. Mm -hmm. And so and so it's not sustainable in that in that you know very individual way. And so and so I think so there's you know, so 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 root cause medicine aligns with a shift in values. Well then there is just the pure money side of it. And and you know the fact that you know that as 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 healthcare inflation continues to be a snowball rolling down the hill, you know, it's it's becoming a threat to companies, our competitiveness, our 401ks. And so, and so the, the mere economics of the, the difference between reversing a chronic condition and simply managing a chronic condition at ever increasing cost is it's just, it's a proposition that's too good, to, too good to pass up. And so what you're seeing on the employer side is a head of health plans and arguably you know, the you know, commercial plans with their minimum loss ratios, it's like the only way for them to make more money is to spend more money. So there's a little bit of a, of a corrupt twist in that incentive structure, in my opinion. But, but, you know, the one group that doesn't have any corruption in that, in that incentive is the employer who's paying the bill, particularly the self-insured employer. And so, you know, when you have a heart attack, it's like they have to write the check. And so they have a huge incentive to try and contain healthcare costs, especially companies that, that have long-term relationships with their employees. Mm -hmm. And you know, it makes sense for them to, you know, to invest. And so you're seeing employer interest really push forward functional medicine. And now that health systems are more and more engaged in, in kind of risk-bearing relationships with plans and populations, that where they're more on the hook for the outcome and the ultimate value rather than the volume of the care that they're, that they're providing, all of a sudden they're interested in some aces up their sleeve on how they can actually create way more value really quickly for an otherwise really expensive population. And so, you know, it's, it, we have all these sort of converging things. I'll also say, and, and this, is, this is sort of the sort of the nerdy side of me, I think there's another factor that's quickly emerging, which is the maturity of sensor technologies and, and wearables like my aura ring here. Mm -hmm. You know, mm -hmm. that are, you know, continuous glucose monitors that right. are, have you played around with a continuous glucose mm -hmm. monitor? Yet? 
Mm -hmm. Holy smoke. The, the education that you can get with two weeks of wearing that freestyle Libra on your back of your arm and learning it's, it's in a million, a million finger pricks. You would never get this education. Not that you would ever want to prick your finger to get the education, <laughs> but my gosh, I can remember the first time I stuck one of those things on me. It was, I guess it was probably the very first or second day I realized I'm, I, I had, I have for years eaten sushi thinking, man, I am the picture of good health eating this sushi not realizing that the white rice was sending my blood sugar through the roof more than ice cream. I mean, crazy. So, <laughs> you know, so it's like I had, and, and then here's a, on the flip side, a long time, all the way back in 2001, this same doctor I was telling you about uh, from that very first practice, he's like, yeah, Tom, a banana is a high glycemic food. You might as well eat an ice cream cone if you're going to eat a banana. And so I'm like, well, I guess I shouldn't eat bananas. So I'm on airplanes all the time, avoiding bananas. I, I never take the banana. I'm, I always want the banana, never take the banana. Well, I'm on an airplane. I'm like, I got this monitor on. Maybe I should check this, check this out. Eat the banana, hardly any bump at all. <laughs> I spent almost two decades without a banana because I didn't have a continuous glucose monitor to fact check this, you know, this idea that it was an ice cream cone. <laughs> You know, and an ice cream cone is, is, is better than sushi, you know, from my, from my blood. So it's like, oh, then I had another one. This was a really crazy one. I'm sitting in a train station waiting for someone to come and get on the train with me. So it's like, I'm not late. She's late. The train's there. Everyone's boarding. And I'm thinking we're going to miss the train. So she gets there at the last second. We barely get on the train. Now we're on the train. And I look at my, at my blood sugar reading and holy smoke, blood sugar is up 30 points. I didn't eat anything. I just was. And so the relationship between stress and blood sugar, mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. I had no idea, you know, you get stressed, your body doesn't realize that the tiger's not coming and you don't actually need all the extra sugar for fuel. So yeah. you know, it's coursing around in your system. So yeah. I mean, just the learnings that you can get from that simple little technology and then you throw in something like this aura ring where you're really picking apart the quality of your sleep, your heart mm -hmm. rate variability and your stress. And it's yeah. like you become, you, we've got these little laboratories that let me tell you, it, for me, it, you know, it, it, who, and I struggle with, with like finding the motivation to change behaviors, having these quantitative measures to say, oh, look, it's working. And, and when I go to bed at, you know, and only get five hours of sleep, my, my average blood sugar the next day is going to be six points higher. And I know that to be true. You know what I mean? When mm -hmm. I eat dinner at 1130 at night, my, my sleep is going to be crap as it always is. If you, if, I mean, boy, yeah. eating at night for me anyway, mm -hmm. is deter simply determines how my right. sleep quality is going to be. Right. So I think that, that tools like this that give people this window into kind of how their bodies work in a much more exciting real way real time way mm -hmm. are going to are going to drive even more interest in 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 functional medicine. Yeah, I'm so glad you brought those things up and you you commenting on exactly what I was hoping for which was this peek into kind of like how does this all fit together and where are things manifesting and I want to add to and highlight a couple of the things you said because I'm seeing it in my practice and I'm seeing it in my own life. And so just to shed some light on this in real time today, well, my phrase for functional medicine is uh, the phenomenon in culture is co-emergence of the same truths in multiple domains. So the probiotics show up at Safeway in, as an additive in something. And the probiotics show up in, you watch uh, PBS and they're interviewing a functional medicine expert about the gut brain connection. And next thing you know, it's Mark Hyman. And the next thing you know, it's your functional medicine doctor. And the next thing you know, it's your neighbor. Like the probiotic gut uh, thing shows up over and over again. And uh, what you flagged today, wearable devices and real-time data and how it motivates us, that came up with the other person I interviewed today. Just three C-worthy functional medicine podcasts in one day. Uh, the same thing came up about the continuous blood glucose monitoring, so many of the people I take care of are finding the foods they thought were problems weren't, the foods that didn't seem like problems are, and half of them are telling me, oh my gosh, it's not the food, it's the stress. Yeah, <laughs> it's exactly right. And yeah. 
And so then this functional medicine feels to them like, you know, it felt as a kid to run out and ride your bike all day. You feel good. You don't have to like schedule bike riding as fun. You just got this thing happening in real time. You're like, well, I'm going to get another hour of sleep tonight. Or like, I'm going to breathe for a minute while I wait for Jenny to miss the train. Right. Because I'm going to have to preempt that 30 point, you know, right. blood glucose spike. <laughs> and it's I think, deal. I think people are going to just, uh, this is just going to the way this reiterates and um, amplifies and uh, ramifies out through this explosion of functional medicine. We're just at the, we're at the beginning because um, people will say, well, you know, now that I know more about this, I'm more of a yoga person or a meditation person, or I consistently skip dinner, I do better skipping breakfast, then I take it back to my coach or my doctor, then I take it to my team visit, then my employer gives me a discount for taking better care of my, you know, yeah, all these nodes in these webs start interconnecting and the way it's changing in society is very organic. It's not sort of siloed or black and white change even, it's this sort of organic reimagining within all of these stresses we're under. A certain group of people are kind of finding, oh my gosh, this works better. I'm happier, I'm having more fun, I'm healthier. It feels like working smarter rather than harder. Absolutely, for sure. Yeah. yeah. It's, it's um, you know, in terms of, it, it, we have to recognize that, you know, there are a number of things that stand in the way of us forming habits and changing behavior and, 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 and you know, cost is one, but just the friction of it, how hard is it to do and, mm -hmm. and how hard is it to, to feel successful doing it? Mm -hmm. You know, it's, uh, you know, like, I, you know, I don't know if you've tried out the prolon fasting mimicking diet. You know what I'm talking about? Uh, well, I'm very, yeah, I'm familiar with those. And so I do, um, I do best when I skip uh, dinner. Now, I haven't done the exact one that you're describing, but in terms of time-restricted eating, if my last bite of food is by six, I sleep better and I have less belly fat. Yeah. Well, I mean, that's a great example too. I mean, any kind of effort you're exerting, if you, you know, if, if you don't have something like an aura ring, you know, then you're going to, you've got to really be dialed into knowing how you feel and sensing you know improvement which sometimes is hard you know it's like when you wake up in the morning you know you're kind of like how do i exactly feel was that a good night of sleep was it not and you know and 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 having an actual way to measure and give yourself some feedback and some you know some success feedback it's a form of biofeedback it's not mm -hmm. exactly real time but it's i mean oh my gosh it is such a fantastic i finally got my wife on you know, to, to, to use an aura ring mm -hmm. and and it's like, I can't believe how, how much easier it is to convince her that we cannot be staying awake until all the kids are finished playing their video games or whatever, <laughs> you know, or, we, or we're going to pay the price. Mm -hmm. And so, it's, you know, and it's like, there it is in the numbers. It's, oh, it's so, it's so helpful. Now, you know, you did also ask about, about your know, mention the pandemic. And so, and so sort of zooming out on the pandemic and the effect that that's having on functional medicine, I think maybe maybe one of the most if not the most important thing that's happened with the uh, you know with with the pandemic and sort of and sort of waking us up i mean i there's probably i i'm certain that in in all of our lives there's probably never been a uh, a, a single event that has focused our attention on a topic in health like like the pandemic has and so you know we're in this you know really unusual time where it's like the general public has a pretty shocking degree of expertise in a particular condition and, and now people are educated enough to know, okay, if I get this, you know, I may have vascular, downstream vascular, you know, complications as a result of it. I mean, there's weird things happening on the back of it. If I have diabetes, if I'm really overweight, if I have hypertension, it's like somehow that's, you know, makes this thing worse. And, and of course, the fact that it affects people in such wildly different ways subconsciously tells us that, you know, that, that you know, our health is very individual in the way that we respond to things. And so, and so the thing that I think that people are, are recognizing for, you know, maybe for the first time in a really real way is the difference between managing a condition and erasing that condition. You know, your well-managed hypertension versus the hypertension you used to have, and now you have worked through that and no longer do, you know, 
COVID sees right past the management veil, you know, and, and mm -hmm. so it's like, you know, I think that there's, it's just yet another motivation for people to, uh, you know, really want to kind of engage in their health in a, mm -hmm. you know, in, 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 in an effort to, you know, to, to prevent the consequences of COVID. So, so to me, that's a very positive thing. The, uh, you know, from a healthcare you know, sort of, sort of viewpoint, I think the exciting thing about, about COVID, I hope for most people is that they'll take the opportunity, especially working with someone like you in functional medicine, take the opportunity to experience virtual healthcare. You know, I mean, functional mm -hmm. medicine so lends itself to, it's, a, it's much more consultative than it is poking and prodding. Yeah, you need some mm -hmm. labs from time to time, but you know, it's, it's, it's so lends itself to, mm -hmm. you know, to, to this, you know, this sort of delivery medium. And, and I, you know, I think that people that are, you know, that are, you know, have been sort of sitting at home kind of thinking, well, I guess with COVID, I just have to see how long I can go without healthcare. Will you know, will seek out someone that thinks of health like you and also is equipped, you know, to have, you know, to have virtual visits. Yeah. So, yeah. That's exciting. Yeah, thanks. I saw it coming a couple of years ago that in Alaska, the challenge we had is that my service area for our local hospital was about 16,000 people, but I'm licensed to help anyone in Alaska. That's 740,000 people. So just in terms of service area, just by rebuilding the practice so that anybody in the state of Alaska could have their primary care doctor or medical provider sign off that they were safe to participate, which is a relatively low bar. Most mm -hmm. people are safe to participate in the restoration of native vitality <laughs> through, you know, whole food and getting enough sleep and having a positive attitude. So, um, you know, uh, but nonetheless, in um, uh, pointing to, okay, you've got a primary care provider. You've got somebody that can sew up your laceration. You've got somebody that you can see locally to get your blood sugar down if it skyrockets or if you've got pneumonia or your yep. blood pressure is 210 over 130. That's not functional medicine. Mm -hmm. That's conventional medicine. Yep. Uh, but at just every two years, if somebody in Alaska sees their primary care medical provider, then they can work with me remotely from anywhere in Alaska. We also set it up so that the person's an Alaskan patient if they've seen me once here. Nice. And so they can travel from anywhere. They can go to Seattle or Chicago or whatever, and Homer's a fun place to visit. And it was just so exciting then, kind of going back to how I felt when I heard you three to four years ago and how I feel now. I feel like I took your excitement from back then and I translated it forward into the actual work of like, what does this model mean for me in Alaska to serve? And I loved the idea that somebody in Juneau or Anchorage or Barrow or Sitka or whatever could think, oh, I heard that functional medicine is so good for autoimmune conditions or fatigue or gut problems or enhancing immune resilience uh, so that I'm less likely to get COVID or I'll do better in the wake of it, et cetera, you know, they can just um, establish remotely. And um, yeah, there's not much poking or prodding that goes with much of functional medicine and their, their primary care person can do that for them locally. So it's just a new day. And I, I feel this sense of excitement and joy um, at going through the pain point of reimagining my practice, because now I feel like I've got the service model, right? Yeah. Yep. And you have to adjust the service model in order to adjust the, you know, to shift from high volume conventional treadmill primary care to dealing with, you know, with, with underlying causes. You know, while we're, before we totally leave the topic of COVID, the other thing that, that, that it has done, uh, I think for the medical community, but also the general public is awaken people to the importance of, of nutrition and nutritional supplementation. I mean, look at studies coming out around COVID and low vitamin D, you know, mm -hmm. COVID and low zinc. You know, mm -hmm. and so understanding that, holy crap, these, you know, these nutritional supplements, you know, provided that they're of good quality, you know, actually do move the needle on your risk profile for a condition like that. They actually do sort of feed the gears in your, you know, in your body in the way that your, your health works. So I definitely, I mean, and, and, and this Lord, the supplement industry has seen the effect of that. Now I will say they, the, the supplement industry broadly has both benefited from it, but also there's, you know, I, I think unfortunately been a bit of uh, taking advantage of the consumer in this mm -hmm. window of time, which more than ever, I think speaks to the need to have 
uh, a professional curator of natural products. I mean, in the U.S., we don't have the, the regulations that we need to. And it is, you know, for people out there that go to Costco and take your multivitamin or whatever, the value of having a physician that knows what they're doing curating natural products mm. is actually really huge. And so, yeah. you know, which is now another thing that, that most functional medicine practices also offer their patients. Well, I'm glad that you're bringing up both COVID and supplements, because again, I think a lot of the people listening today, these are going to be super salient topics to them and had a couple of, um, I flashed on a couple of things on both topics, one on uh, COVID. I'm so excited to see that Institute for Functional Medicine in about two weeks is offering a class mm -hmm. uh, with a year of follow-up for certified practitioners like myself, for uh, other individuals that learn from IFM, what the science is of, of resilience and, um, you know, uh, having less of a chance of getting COVID and having a better outcome if you contract it. Yep. Now, this is again, because it's from IFM, of course, it's, it's very accurate and honest and transparent. It's not presenting itself as a cure or a cure-all. But, um, you know, what I envision happening is that I'm gonna be taking that class and then I'm going to start to talk to stakeholders in the community about how do I get the information out to my community as a community service about what I'm learning in real time from IFM about zinc and vitamin D and quercetin and sleep and whole food and eating the rainbow and stress management and yep. wearable devices and a bunch of those specifics that people are so thirsty for like, oh my gosh, if I use my Apple Watch to check my sleep that helps me be resilient in the face of covid i'm going to act on that yep and then the uh you know the supplements what i found is that um, i was a little discouraged when i realized that there's a subset of supplements that matter and make sense that are professional grade and are appropriately curated and there's a number of supplements that don't make sense and they haven't been properly curated either by the manufacturer or by the person recommending them and that's poignant but that's definitely what i see people um, needing my training for and trusting me to do is get them. Um, and I, I think it's so nice that supplements properly chosen. I really have found all my folks that will have skin in the game, which you mentioned at the beginning of the interview, yep. they will do the work and sleep and move and eat whole food they don't end up needing a lot of supplements. They need just a little handful of laser targeted supplements that pack a lot of punch and have a lot of leverage. Yep. Absolutely. So, so yeah, it's a humongous service for, for patients to have a doctor that's, that's got the training to, to, to curate high quality products and, and, uh, and, 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 and then the, the willingness to actually, you know, to actually like make them available to patients, which, you know, which, you know, it's, it's, uh, it's interesting. In our survey, we just did a humongous 3,505 respondent survey of, amongst uh, root cause medicine practitioners. And, uh, and at last, 80% of the MDs now actually, now actually offer supplements through their office. Mm. So interesting. Now, it's still another 20% to go, but it's, I mean, I can remember when that, that number was less than 50%. And so to see 80% now making supplements available was, and then of course the other practitioner types, it was you know, 90 plus percent. So mm -hmm. yeah. Uh, yeah. Yeah. It took me a while to, I came out of a really uh, uh, conservative uh, medical um, background family wise. And it took me a long time to get my head around supplements personally and professionally. Mm -hmm. And then, and then I kind of um, became super enamored of them to the point of not educating my patients that they had skin in the game. And I feel like I'm now at, at this 14 years into functional medicine, I'm having this aha moment that the lifestyle is the cornerstone and foundation of the person's functional medicine house. And yeah. then, then the supplements, oh my gosh, then they're just so almost uh, just wonderfully effective. People are so, are so pleased. Yeah. Yeah. Well, what a blast getting to talk to you today. Are there things that, um, is, is there one thing that you'd love for people to know about functional medicine we didn't get to? You know, I mean, I think that we that we have have done a very nice job actually, kind of covering things. I mean, that this concept of, you know, as of, of health is something that we largely self determine as a skill that you know that that unfolds against sort of the horizon of possibility rather than death as we're used to thinking of it. 
and and getting away from thinking about your doctor's office as a body repair shop where you just go when things are broken and then you go back out and until until something breaks again but rather you know in a in a relationship that's about pursuing a you know a vision for better health i mean it's it's a it's such an exciting exciting possibility for folks that are you know that are kind of ready for it and i think i mean more and more people are all the time and even more so i think with you know with covid so hopefully mm-hmm. someone out there has gotten some uh a dose of you know inspiration to give you a call on the phone and and, uh, <laughs> and find you. <laughs> well, I I knew from again just from that magic moment I had that that it would be great getting to um, have people get to experience that. What I see when I when I think of you, I think of this blend of like common sense and charisma and positivity and pragmatism. You know, just all fused together into this really cool package where it seems to me your preeminent skill is this ability to translate it so that people hearing you can understand this excitement, right? Like what's under the hood and oh my gosh, yeah, let's all move forward together. So I feel so lucky we got to spend this time today. Uh, Well, I feel the same. Thank you for having me. Anytime, I'm happy to come. (laughs) (laughs) Well, that's very gracious of you. Um, Have a good rest of your day and I'll, I'll wrap this up here. All right. Seaworthy exists for people to overcome their health challenges and be fully vital. Please consider subscribing, giving us a five-star review if we've earned it, and going to our website podcast tab for any questions or comments you'd like to share with us. Thanks.